Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will start talking while other people are still joining us. Uh, my name is Pavla Niklova. I'm the executive director of the Václav Havel Library Foundation. And I would like to welcome you at the second Havel conversation live on Zoom. It is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers, journalist, writer, and political commentator, Yiji Pehev, who will be in conversation with Dr. Marilyn Wyatt, former cultural attaché at the US Embassy in Prague, and vice chair of the Havel Foundation Board of Directors. Havel Conversations started as an oral history project when we filmed eminent American personalities of public life, including Madeleine Albright, President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and his father, President Bush Sr., Professors Timothy Snyder, Lee Bollinger, singer and songwriter Susan Vega, and many others. What these people have in common was that they knew Václav Havel, some of them were his very good friends, or they were influenced by his writing and by his life. For this year, we have decided to take Havel Conversations live to Zoom and to ask questions about the future of democracy in the post-pandemic world. It is our great honor that we have two guests with vast expertise and knowledge of politics and culture on both sides of the ocean who can comment perceptively on the state of democratic institutions in the Czech Republic, Central Europe, as well as the United States. Allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers. Yiri Pahe is currently director of New York University in Prague and an affiliated faculty member at the Center for European and Mediterranean Studies at NYU New York. He also teaches at Charles University and gives public lectures. From September 1997 to May 1999, he was director of the political department of Czech President Václav Havel and later served as President Havel's advisor. Previously, Iripa has served as director of Central European Research at the Research Institute of Radio Free Europe in Germany. He's a political analyst and the author of six books on politics, as well as four novels. He has written extensively on developments in Eastern Europe for American, Czech, and German periodicals and academic journals. He is a member of International Forum for Democratic Studies Research Council at National Endowment for Democracy in the US and a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Marilyn Wyatt is a former diplomat who served on cultural affairs as cultural affairs officer at the US Embassy in Prague from 1992 to 1994. Since 2000, she has worked as a consultant in governance to civil society sectors around the world, and more recently as an editor specializing in development and foreign affairs. Her handbook of NGO government governance has been translated into 20 languages. Apart from being the vice chair of the Havel Foundation Board, she serves on the boards of Off the Record, the oldest women's foreign policy forum in the United States, and Muslims for Progressive Values, an advocacy organization. She lived in Prague from 2005 to 2010. She calls Prague her beloved adopted city, to which she returns every year. The conversation will uh, run for about 45 to 60 minutes. We are not strict with the time. Please feel free to send your questions and Yuri and Marilyn will be here to answer them at the end of their talk. The conversation is being recorded and later will be available online. Thank you very much for joining us and Marilyn and Yuri, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, for that nice uh, introduction. Yishi, it's really a delight to have you join our Havel Conversation sponsored by the Václav Havel Library Foundation. Um, it's a good time to be rethinking about um, events in Central Europe and your region now that we have a new administration in the United States. And I hope during our conversation today, we'll be able to pull out some of the most uh, 
important and interesting trends that are happening there. I, I really um, liked Pavlo reminiscing that you used to work for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I was actually in Prague when it moved from Munich to um, Prague in 1993, I think it was thereabouts, not long after um, the Czech Republic was established. And I remember that Havel himself was quite instrumental in, in having it moved there and being a reason that it was moving to Prague. And uh, I know it was a very pr proud moment for the Czechs because it was really a um, sort of a symbol, symbolic recognition that um, the country was no longer, a, or citizens rather, were no longer consumers of, of RFE, but, but actually were supporting its, its mission elsewhere in the world. Um, so I wanna return to the media landscape later because a lot of uh, important things are happening there. But let's first talk about your very interesting observation that was attached to the flyer that went out about our talk today, saying that we needed to retell the story of the Velvet Revolution. Um, what, what makes you say that? What, what kind of, what's happening that uh, is changing the narrative now? Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for um, your moderation and, and participation in this. Um, um, I would uh, answer your question uh, in um, two ways. I think that uh, the fact that we have to uh, rethink the story of 1989 of the Velvet Revolution is partly based on uh, what we see today. For, for a long time, uh, we thought that uh, it was uh, indeed a, a revolution, people rising against the communist regime, uh, a majority of people rising against the communist regime. But if you look at the state of Czech democracy today, and, uh, uh, and uh, if you look at uh, which parties uh, uh, people support, um, we really uh, uh, should, be, should be careful about uh, generalizing uh, the affairs in 1989 as, um, uh, uh, or describing them as a revolution in which a majority of society uh, somehow confronted the regime and, uh, and wanted, uh, uh, wanted uh, very much uh, a liber liberal democratic regime. Uh, because uh, we see today uh, that there's a lot of doubts um, or a lot of doubts about, um, about uh, democracy, that a lot of people in the Czech Republic, just like in all other post-communist countries, do, do not really identify with the, um, with the notion of the very, very notion of, the, of liberal democracy, that some of the countries have problems with uh, the rule of law. And uh, there is also a significant uh, amount of um, what I would call um, post-communist nostalgia it means that a lot of people, especially older people, are uh, openly nostalgic for some of the aspects of the previous regime. So it seems to me that uh, maybe in 1989, uh, a, a minority of, of, of Czech society was indeed uh, uh, very much in favor of, of change and, uh, and transforming uh, the communist regime into a, a democratic regime and a market economy and all of that, but uh, that maybe a majority of society was just uh, sort of piggybacking, if we if 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 say that um, in this way, that, that a lot of people were um, hoping initially that yes, this change could bring uh, maybe an increase in, uh, in, in living standards and would uh, make us catch up with the West very quickly. But uh, later, uh, when they found out that this, this will be difficult and uh, not so quick, they sort of um, um, turned, uh, many of them turned, uh, uh, not an, exactly against this new regime, but uh, became, uh, became very critical of it and, uh, and sometimes indifferent. So that's, uh, that's my first observation. The second observation is that, um, that uh, in all revolutions or in, in regime changes, there's always uh, a minority uh, um, elites, if you want to call them, uh, uh, this is not a very popular term today, elites, but uh, elites that uh, uh, that um, uh, show to the rest of society uh, that there is an alternative. And uh, uh, the Czech Republic was very fortunate, or Czechoslovakia at that point was very fortunate to have a small, very enlightened elite of, uh, of dissidents 
uh, who, uh, with the support of, uh, of, of students and, uh, and people who came from the gray zone, so to speak, who joined them, were able to, um, uh, to bring about this, uh, this change. But uh, uh, at the same time, we should not be blind to the fact that uh, it took uh, quite long, that uh, uh, changes uh, had taken place in, in uh, uh, East Germany, uh, Hungary, Poland, even Bulgaria was ahead of us. And the Czech Republic was really one of the last ones um, and uh, that also, I think, has some, uh, uh, you know, there's some significance in, in this uh, uh, timeline. Um, I'm interested in your observation that uh, there may be a generational difference here, you know, that in, in, during the end of the Cold War, that it was um, largely young people who were responsible for getting out on the streets and, and you know, venturing across the borders and, and uh, really pushing that momentum. Whereas, um, you know, more recently, it's, uh, it's the older generation. So one would assume maybe the same people who are now, um, uh, if not actively pursuing, then at least supporting certain indications that democracy is backsliding in the region. Um, I, I'm thinking of a, of a, a, a statement in Ivan Krastev and uh, Stephen Holmes' recent book about um, democracy, the light that failed. And, and they say that actually um, Central Europeans have a, a congenital fear of catching the wrong train. And that maybe, you know, uh, there's this fear that democracy is the wrong train and they, they need to get off and, and, and look for another another mode of transportation, if you will. Um, how do you, you know, how do you explain that and this kind of generational switch, it almost seems, um, with young people then becoming older people and seemingly, you know, wanting to change trains? Well, uh, a lot of uh, young people or uh, middle-aged people in 1989 uh, who have become older or old today, um, uh, were formed by, by the communist regime. They, whether they liked it or not, they, they brought with them into uh, the new regime a lot of mental stereotypes, uh, uh, language, uh, um, and, and so on, uh, that, uh, that were dominant in, in the communist era. And uh, we could see this post-communist mentality um, uh, very early on, uh, on after 1989, we can see it still today. We, I would argue that uh, Czech society is divided um, uh, at this point roughly 50-50 uh, between people who have uh, uh, become sort of not nostalgic for the old regime, for the security it provided, for some of some of its cultural um, uh, features. And then you have young generation, people who already grew up in, uh, in, in a democratic society. And although this democratic society certainly had a lot of uh, uh, problems and failed in many ways, um, uh, there were all kinds of uh, uh, hitches on the way, uh, ne it, it nevertheless contributed to uh, the fact this, this institutional framework and, uh, and the spirit of democracy that was uh, installed after 1989 sort of contributed to the fact that this, this new generation of people who were already born either before uh, 89, but just a few years before 89 or after 89 are much, much more um, uh, democratically inclined. I don't say that everyone, because we can see that there are a lot of young uh, uh, disaffected, uh, especially young men who uh, vote for some of the extremist parties, but the majority of young people are in the Czech Republic today, I would argue are worldly. Um, they have, a, uh, they have a, a European outlook um, and uh, they do understand that democracy is, is in a way a difficult concept, but uh, uh, that uh, it is and has uh, and always will have problems, but it is, uh, it is a system that is uh, 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 that is worth uh, keeping. So um, there is a generational split and this also explains uh, problems with liberal democracy in the region in, uh, in general. I think that what we see in this, uh, in this region and not only in the Czech Republic is, uh, is really uh, a generation, generational shift 
uh, and we can see that uh, about um, uh, half of those uh, post-communist societies, uh, whether it is uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, but also Eastern part of Germany are still um, uh, sort of um, uh, dominated by people, especially politicians who who uh, were uh, formed as, as persons uh, uh, during the communist regime. And I think that contributes to some of the specific uh, features of, uh, uh, of specific problems with liberal democracy in this region, because of course there is the other part and I can already uh, hear um, uh, an argument from one of our participants, uh, some of our participants that, uh, you know, don't we see this, uh, these problems with liberal democracy everywhere in the West today? And I would say, yes, we, we do. And, uh, and certainly some of the problems that we have have been caused by, um, by uh, problems that uh, people in the West faced as well. That means uh, globalization, uh, new challenges connected to globalization, um, uh, the, uh, the new media and all of that, which, uh, which, just, which uh, all of these things contributing to um, maybe a, a paradigm shift in, in what we call liberal democracy. But in um, uh, the Central European region, it is also this other um, side, which I would, I would argue is still pretty much uh, caused by, um, by, the, by the legacy of, uh, of uh, communism or legacy of its mentality. I, I think you're totally right. And one way in which you see that is I, returning to the media um, landscape, what is happening in some of the countries with the media. For example, you know, Hungary being the most prominent among them with the um, independent media sector pretty much collapsing. Um, just last week, the Hungarian government closed down the last independent um, media, uh, radio station. And in fact, Radio Free Europe has moved back into broadcasting in Hungarian to, to help fill that gap. Um, you saw something similar happening in Poland with uh, an effort to impose a, a tax on independent media uh, to you know constrict their resources and, and their operations, presumably. And uh, Radio Free Europe has also started resumed broadcasting in, in Romania and Bulgaria. Um, and then, of course, in Slovakia, there was Jan Kuchak's murder a few years ago. He was investigating corruption at the highest level of the government. And although his two killers um, have been convicted, the, the um, businessman who was behind it was just acquitted last week. So, all, you know, altogether, as, as a journalist, you know, what, how do you view this trend and, and where do you think it is heading? Well, it's a very unfortunate trend, although um, maybe um, uh, it's, it, it is a trend that could, uh, could have been expected to some extent, because I think that uh, in uh, the first 10 years after the fall of communism, uh, there was a lot of confusion um, in the minds of, of, of people um, uh, about what uh, the whole notion of liberal democracy is. Uh, liberalism was confused with neoliberalism, which was very prominent in the West at that point. That means with, with economic uh, liberalism, with the invisible hand of the market, which uh, has caused a lot of a lot of difficulties uh, in the region, uh, economic difficulties, and of course, then all of the problems with the transformation process, which were uh, to some extent inevitable, but some of them could have been avoided. And that, of course, uh, sort of tarnished uh, the, the image, the idea of, of liberal democracy, and um, and so I think that we we do have uh, we do have uh, a lot of people who see uh, liberal democracy as a problem that that contributed to their difficulties, and uh, and they don't understand fully this concept. They don't understand that that what is really important about uh, the system of liberal democracy is, is liberal constitutionalism, the rule of law, um, sticking to the rules of, of the game, so to speak. And so um, uh, some politicians, of course, uh, in uh, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, but also in the Czech Republic noticed that this is, this is a growing sentiment among a lot of people. And, and that if you connect it with nationalism, uh, with the revival of some sentiments, which uh, uh, are very strong in some of these countries, for example, 
the slightly uh, messianistic uh, tendencies in Hungarian and Polish uh, political cultures, uh, uh, or um, the sense of grievance, historical grievances, especially in Hungary, you can you can you can actually uh, cook a pretty good uh, uh, mix soup, uh, political soup that you can, can you can use very effectively, and this this is what happened. I think that um, the Czech Republic is uh, still pretty fortunate, even though we have uh, uh, let's say what. Uh, a populist leader, I would call it an oligarchic uh, populism, because our leader is, of course, a billionaire, uh, one of the richest persons in, in the Czech Republic, and he's using his power and his uh, control of some media um, to propagate his cause, but, uh, but he's very pragmatic at the same time. Uh, whereas in Hungary, Poland, and in Slovakia, uh, we uh, saw a, an ideological shift in some ways. And also what is really important and what make what can make a huge difference is that uh, is the institutional framework because uh, uh, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia had electoral systems and constitutional systems which did not protect them very well against the possibility of, of one party rule and uh, and uh, and uh, con and constitutional or media changes and, and so on. So uh, Hungary, Poland, and uh, and Slovakia have had um, uh, one-party rule uh, or go uh, governments after after 1989, and those governments, once they gained the absolute majority, had nothing better to do than to start uh, um, uh, changing uh, the rules of the game because they thought this is this is uh, advantageous for us. They, there was this basic misunderstanding of what liberal democracy is is all about. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, we were not faced with this, confronted with this simply because when Czechoslovakia was falling apart, uh, we were very lucky to have uh, a group of, uh, of uh, constitutional, or uh, I would say fathers and mothers of the constitution who wrote uh, the Czech constitution in such a way that uh, it basically makes it very difficult to change the constitutional framework, to change the electoral law, uh, we have uh, uh, two chambers in the parliament, which are elected on, um, uh, each of them is elected on, on, uh, on different, uh, by different uh, electoral system, uh, which uh, means that uh, um, the current opposition in the lower chamber is dominating the upper chamber and the Senate can veto any attempts to, uh, to introduce constitutional changes and media changes. So the Czech Republic has escaped all of this, but Hungary, which has only the lower chamber, one chamber, Slovakia the same, and Poland that has uh, two chambers, it's true, but the Senate is elected in basically uh, in the same way as, as uh, same, has faced these problems with one party rules. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, uh, especially in Hungary and Poland, as we have uh, noticed, is uh, it's getting very bad. Uh, and both of them are basically now um, challenged by the European Union, um, tried by the European Union, to be precise, um, uh, for violating the basic principles of liberal democracy and the rule of law. I'd like to turn to questions from our listeners in a few minutes and encourage all of you to um, submit using the chat button down at the bottom screen of uh, your Zoom program. Um, but let's talk a bit about, about the United States and its presence in, in Central Europe. Um, of course, President Trump was always seen as um, sort of um, almost like a validator or supporter of, of strongmen in, um, in Hungary. And, um, you know, the Polish uh, Law and Justice Party, which is, is rolling back civil, civil liberties and, and the rule of law and so forth. What does his exit now imply um, for the region? Do you, do you think that with the Biden administration coming in, um, that liberal, liberal democracies will be strengthened. Um, I'm thinking particularly of his assertion that human rights are going to now be a pillar of US foreign policy. Could that have a practical effect in, in Central Europe, particularly if the European Union is not willing to act, which it, you know, it has not shown up to this point, a whole lot of enthusiasm uh, for doing in, in, in the cases of Hungary and Poland. Um, 
And, and, and finally, uh, what would you recommend the Biden's ad administration's goals, goals to be in Central Europe as it, as it tries to rebuild the alliance of democracies? Yes, so of course the Trump administration and uh, Donald Trump uh, in particular uh, have been very um, uh, so say encouraging news for, for some of the uh, authoritarian or would-be authoritarian leaders in, in Central Europe. Uh, uh, Trump's advisor Steve Bannon was in Central Europe uh, talking to uh, some of the leading uh, political figures in the region, uh, assuring them that uh, uh, that uh, a uh, something like a national populist uh, in, uh, alliance is on on the horizon with uh, with the help of money he has for that purpose, and they all were uh, extremely pleased with uh, with this. And of course, it's uh, to some extent strengthened them politically, although. Um, majorities of, of societies in uh, Central Europe uh, were certainly anti-Trump. They were they they never became um, uh, maybe with the exception of Poland, where it was sort of 50-50 because of may, may, mainly of security uh, concerns. Uh, it was it was never um, uh, these societies were never really pro pro Trump, uh, but. Uh, um, it created a certain kind of atmosphere which was not very conducive to, um, or which which was very uh, uh, positive for for parties that are not uh, uh, really friends of of, of democracy. Uh, we have seen uh, that their they, they sort of very often reference their behavior, their actions by uh, by Donald Trump's actions. And so I think that uh, the change in the United States will also um, have uh, some effects now in the opposite uh, direction. That means that it will be an encouragement for uh, more uh, liberal centrist uh, political uh, forces. Um, you can see that already uh, some, some leaders in Central Europe are very um, uh, uncertain how to react to this change uh, because, uh, for example, in the Czech Republic, I'm speaking from Prague, of course, uh, the Czech, Czech president, uh, Miloš Zeman, one of the first things that he did was to call Donald Trump and and uh, announce that he uh, is called Czech Trump and that he would like to go to White House, which uh, never never happened in the end. Uh, the, the prime minister, Babish, was also very... Um, positive about the Trump administration, about Trump personally, he even on his web page introduced uh, the red cap, the baseball cap with uh, um, America first, but it was uh, Czech Republic first. Uh, and all of these references, which were of course, which, which have some influence and uh, some, some meaning. So I think that now it will all be um, different. Uh, some of these leaders are sort of trying very hard to find a new New position and show a friendly face towards uh, the Biden administration, uh, but certainly mm, I would argue that uh, um, uh, it will be easier for uh, for people who want to advocate human rights, who want to advocate uh, liberal democratic causes, and, and so on um, now because uh, they uh, certainly have. Um, um, at least uh, will have some support in in the United States, and that uh, that will be important symbolically, but also from a practical point of view. Um, speaking of human rights, here's a, an interesting question who's, that's come in from one of our listeners um, named Michael, who says, "Having lived in Brno and taught at Masaryk University in 2015, I came to see that many Czechs." who are even supposedly liberal and democratic and educated um, have very hateful attitudes towards the Roma minority. Do you see any hope for the position of the Roma and the perception of Roma by the Czech people improving in the future? I see this as something of a canary in the gold mine for pro po possible rise of uh, right-wing extremism in Czechia. Yes, um, so the first generation of, uh, of people who uh, were Sort of uh, who found themselves in a democratic regime after 1989 brought with them, as I said, a lot of uh, stereotypes, mental stereotypes, and uh, and uh, 
other attitudes which were quite common during uh, the late communist uh, era. And one of them certainly was this, um, uh, this view of the Roma minority, but not only the Roma minority, but minorities in general, which was um, rather, rather xenophobic and, uh, and hostile. And uh, there was a tendency to, um, to make, especially the Roma minority, uh, a scapegoat for a lot of problems that the country had. It was uh, certainly not very courageous from those people because uh, uh, the Roma minority uh, was socially very weak and disadvantaged and handicapped. And, uh, and, uh, and, and yet there was this tendency to blame a lot of problems that actually were um, created by, 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 by majority in the Czech Republic um, on them. Uh, for a long time, there was really no uh, co comprehensive program for, uh, for this, uh, how to elevate this minority, how to integrate them uh, better into uh, society at large. And in fact, uh, we saw um, in, um, uh, let's say, 15, 20 years after the fall of communism, we saw uh, a trend towards uh, moving a lot of uh, um, uh, people of, of Roma origin into ghettos, creating ghettos, um, because uh, uh, the uh, prevailing opinion was that it was uh, a good thing to separate them from the rest of society. I think this is slightly changing because uh, I think that, um, again, this, this shift, this generational shift, uh, also is bringing um, changes in attitudes. Uh, young people who are more European, more um, exposed to ideas such as multiculturalism, other uh, different people, they, uh, they are not, uh, they see that this is a problem and they are not uh, a priori hostile towards this, this minority. So uh, it's, uh, it's a long, um, uh, long process longer than I, I hoped uh, uh, that would it would be when in the mid 90s I, I worked for um, or I cooperated with the Soros Foundation in Prague and we uh, we had a lot of projects to help uh, the Roma minority and educate uh, to, to create education for them and to abolish what we call special schools where a lot of Roma kids are sent um, uh, regardless of their uh, real abilities, uh, but it has uh, it has been uh, much slower than we all all hoped. I think that uh, um, a solution not only to this but uh, but in general to to better attitudes of uh, of a lot of Czech towards minorities and to people who are different uh, that includes uh, refugees and migrants as well is in um, in the development of civil society. This was something since we are talking on um, uh, one of the reference points is Václav Havel, uh, it was this idea that we really have to build uh, a vibrant civil society and until it is created, until um, it's strong enough to sort of uh, fertilize political parties with its ideas and, uh, and uh, attitudes and so on, uh, it will be very difficult um, to create a full, um, full-fledged democracy. And this is what we see today. We, we still we still have uh, some way to go, um, and um, uh, I would refer here to um, to the work of uh, uh, Ralph Darendorf in 1990, um, who wrote the famous essay about the transformation process. And I remember how uh, many of my colleagues and, and politicians in the Czech Republic were upset about his prediction that. Uh, to transform political political sphere, it will take a few years to transform the economy into a market economy. Maybe ten years to transform uh, the, this uh, legal sphere into a functioning rule of law. Fifteen twenty years, but to create a full fledged democracy based on uh, a vibrant civil society will take maybe sixty years, two generations. And uh, and I. We, we all were a bit skeptical about that prediction. We thought, okay, Czech, Czechoslovakia, at least, unlike maybe Hungary or Poland, had its experience, its democratic experience from before World War II. So why should it take so long? But today, uh, we all have to um, uh, admit that uh, Darendorf was probably uh, right. Exactly. Um, just following on that, here are two questions I think that I'll, I'll combine together because they address similar topics. 
The rule of law is obviously being threatened in Poland, but how do you find the recent public protests against the abortion ruling? Doesn't, don't they show hope for vibrant democracy? And then the election last July was also closer than ex expected. Was that cause for optimism? Um, but at the same time, do you think a strong reaction from the EU, either by limiting voting rights or reducing funding towards the assault on the rule of law in Poland and Hungary um, would also help? And, uh, or would it only strengthen nationalist tendencies? So uh, I think that Poland in particular, uh, I'm not so sure about Hungary, but Poland in particular um, is uh, traditionally a, a society uh, where uh, civic acti activism uh, is very strong. And, uh, and so uh, we see that politically Poland has been dominated for, uh, uh, I don't know how many years now, maybe 10 years by, uh, by um, uh, the, the conservatives uh, by, by the Kaczynski party, uh, but um, uh, it is it is something that uh, doesn't really capture what Poland uh, is is all about. Poland is a very pol polarized uh, country uh, because uh, uh, you can see a lot of uh, civic activism and a lot of pro democratic uh, uh, or liberal democratic. Uh, 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 attitudes and liberal uh, people who are oriented or prefer um, uh, sort of centrist liberal views to to the current uh, conservative, very conservative and nationalist government uh, in big cities. But then you see um, the other part of Poland, uh, which uh, when you travel there, uh, of course, reminds someone like a uh, person like me who uh, grew up in Czechoslovakia, which is not really religious, and then lived in the West, reminds me of uh, of something from from the past, which uh, we didn't even experience here fully. Something that perhaps existed in the 19th century here. So it's a it's a it's a different kind of uh, framework, different kind of society. But I really believe very strongly that Poland is. Uh, that there's a process, for, process of emancipation. I think that the government uh, made a huge mistake by uh, uh, backing this very strong uh, uh, anti-abortion law because it has activated uh, uh, women as a political force. Uh, you can see these huge demonstrations in Poland which are run by, by women. Uh, there is a big... Um, uh, threat to the Catholic Church in Poland, by the way, because people, young people en masse are giving up their um, uh, Catholicism. They, they uh, have to do it in person, go to um, uh, their parish and, and say, I, I, I don't want to be a member of the Catholic Church anymore, but this is going and happening in large numbers. Uh, so I think that the government has, um, has misfired with this, uh, with this law. And um, and I think that in Poland, there is still a pretty good chance that uh, uh, the pendulum will, swift, uh, will shift to the, uh, the other side. That means uh, from the current very conservative nationalist uh, government to a more centrist liberal uh, government. Uh, in Hungary, mm, it will be more difficult because I think that uh, Orban has managed to entrench uh, uh, his authoritarian um, regime uh, very deeply and very well, and uh, and uh, it will be. And there is no um, there is opposition in Hungary, but uh, uh, not as strong as in Poland, and uh, and not as well as well organized. You know, um, it's it seems to me that civil society was uh, really one of the most important achievements um, in Central and Eastern Europe since nineteen. 89, you know, the case of Poland um, is, is an important illustration, but also um, the Million Moments movement in the Czech Republic before the COVID crisis. We have a question here. Um, usually we were very encouraged by the Freedom Festival organized by Jan Gregor and all of the young people. Thir uh, 130,000 in Wenceslas Square in November 2019. Um, what influence do they have? And attached to that, do you see the COVID, um, the COVID crisis and resp government's response to, um, to that, um, in some cases, almost seeming to cut back on civil liberties as 
um, eating into those very successful sh social movements that were getting underway before the pandemic hit. Yeah, so I think that uh, the government was very lucky, uh, very fortunate in a paradoxical way that uh, the COVID um, epidemic uh, came because uh, just before uh, it came, uh, there were these huge demonstrations organized by uh, the Million Moments for Democracy and by other young people, the Fest Freedom Festival and other groups. Um, uh, young people have learned how to use uh, uh, social media, how to organize themselves very effectively. They were able to call uh, really huge demonstrations, but it was not just those public uh, demonstrations, but also what was going on uh, on the net, so to speak, where people would exchange views, petitions, and, and all of that. So uh, I think that uh, this was this was a significant change. Um, you know, Czech civil society in, in the last 30 years uh, has gone through, I would argue, three stages. At first, there was uh, it was very lame, um, very unsure of what to do, how to organize itself. Uh, some some may remember it. You probably do as well because you were um, you, maybe you were not in Prague uh, at, that point, at that time already. But but in 1994 there was a famous discussion between Václav Klaus and Václav Havel. Klaus, uh, a libertarian, uh, argued that civil society is uh, is an invention of dissidents from. Uh, from the pre-89 era that this is just an idealistic concept and there's nothing like civil society that we don't need this mitigating or uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, um, segments, uh, collective segments between the individual and the state. Um, and Havel, of course, uh, countered with his uh, vision of civil society. And it took several years because of this very hostile attitude of Václav Klaus towards civil society to actually pass a law on, on uh, civic foundations, civic uh, associations and so on. And then it sort of took off, but the first 10 years were very, um, the civil society was really certainly not very strong. It was easily uh, defeated. Uh, I, uh, I was um, personally involved with a movement called uh, Impulse 99. I was one of the first three speakers. And I remember how, how politicians really didn't understand what civil society was. They saw, us, they saw us immediately as competitors who want to take over political power. They didn't want to accept the argument that we are there to, uh, to help, uh, that, that a lot of, a lot of uh, top Czech intellectuals who joined would have something, to, something positive to offer and, and, um, and, and so on. So that was the first phase. Then um, the second one was um, uh, anti-corruption movements, which were already started uh, after 2000, 2005 uh, by, uh, by young people who learned how to work with modern technologies and they would, for example, monitor uh, budgets of municip municipalities and various transactions and so on. And they would say, this politician or this group is corrupt. And, but it was heavily focused on corruption because it was a big problem. And then uh, Mr. Babish came to power in 2013 and, uh, and uh, a lot of people viewed him and still view him as, as a threat to democracy to some extent. And so these uh, huge uh, pro-democracy movements were born. And uh, if you look at the uh, age composition, these are mainly young people. These are people who, um, who are um, 30, 35, but young, mostly younger. I remember uh, when I went to one of the demonstrations at uh, Letna where there were 350,000 people and I looked around by, I was uh, by, I was by 30 years the, the oldest person there. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really something new and very, uh, very effective, efficient and effective. Of course, uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, um, epidemic uh, uh, caused, uh, a lot of problems for this movement because uh, a significant feature of, of this movement was public demonstrations and it, it's not possible now. But I think that they have succeeded to some extent already in changing the Czech political landscape because uh, uh, before they, they appeared, it was uh, quite often argued that uh, given the economic uh, growth of the Czech Republic and the fact that uh, the Babish government was very successful economically, uh, that um, 
it would be probably impossible to to change uh, political political uh, situation in the Czech Republic, and uh, and uh, so we had the Babish's movement, Ano, and then we had um, his allies, but then we had had the opposition, which was uh, which was very um, uh, scattered and disunited, and the Million Moments for Democracy said, okay. Uh, we want the opposition to actually unite, to create a, uh, a united force against Babish. And if you don't do it, we will turn against you. And and they did. And so now we have, for the first time in in many years or several years, we have uh, opinion polls showing that uh, uh, the two new coalitions that were formed under pressure from Million Moments for Democracy uh, by opposition parties. Uh, that they are actually getting ahead of Babish in opinion polls. So um, they already had a significant impact, which cannot be uh, underestimated. Um, here's, a, here's a good one. Um, what, were you, what was your reaction to the events of January 6th in Washington, DC? Uh, do Czechs now think of American democracy differently? And um, I'd also like, if I could um, add uh, a sort of a second part to that question, um, speaking of young people's use of social media and the growth of social media in general, um, and, and the role that social media had in the events of January 6th in Washington, DC, um, do you see it taking on that sort of malign uh, or facilitating, you know, malign um, efforts the way in the Czech Republic and elsewhere in the region the way it has in the United States. So, two-part question. Yeah. So, of course, uh, what happened on the sixth of January uh, was watched by most of us in horror, quite frankly, because uh, very few people would expect that uh, that even after four years of uh, of uh, uh, Trump government, which was certainly um, not uh, uh, a, a prime example of uh, of um, of democratic attitudes and respect for um, a lot of principles that that had uh, sort of uh, characterized American democracy in the past. Uh, very few people thought that this this would be possible, and it it did happen. So of course, it was um, it was a shock, and it was also. For a lot of people, um, uh, a certain disappointment because how could this happen in in the uh, in in the country which is the leader of the Western world um, has one of the oldest democracies in the world? So people, especially people who who have not uh, followed uh, uh, American developments or American society, American politics. Uh, in, in detail were very confused and I, I was getting because I often comment comment here on American uh, politics uh, I I was getting a lot of a lot of uh, emails private emails from people who were really confused they didn't know how to interpret this they they didn't know what to do with this uh, uh, with these events so uh, so yes I think that uh, hopefully hopefully things will be better, although um, it will it'll take uh, probably uh, some time. Uh, but uh, in, uh, in general, I think that, um, um, yes, uh, social media is, uh, is uh, part of the problem. It's, it's becoming increasingly clear. Um, I remember uh, a book by um, Robert Putnam in uh, two, the year 2000, 20 years ago, when he wrote um, about uh, uh, about civil society, and was called, I think, "Bowling Alone," and and he was yeah, and he he described civil society, uh, and it was a bestseller. Then he was invited to White to the White House for because of that book, and he was arguing that there are some worrying trends because uh, uh, American civil society is withering away, that uh, people who've become couch potatoes and they, they, don't, uh, they don't congregate, they don't meet each other physically and this, this has affected uh, civil society. Little did he know that there was already this other trend that you just uh, touched on, uh, that is that uh, in a few years there will be this other civil society 
which will exist virtually in, in cyberspace, and that it will not be uh, entirely uh, positive because uh, uh, that, that kind of civil society, of course, has brought, uh, created huge possibilities for very quick mobilization and, and a lot of positive things. And we, we saw it during the Arab Spring, for example, when um, people were mobilized through uh, social media and, uh, and, and so on. But uh, we also saw the other side of these, uh, these movements, these uh, um, uh, big uh, um, uh, social um, uh, upheavals disappeared after, uh, after a few weeks. They, they, it was like a bubble which would burst and it would be gone and nothing was left but the old structures again. And so now uh, we see the, uh, the even more worrying side of this, and that is that um, a lot of people don't, uh, that not only good people, um, civil people, and that's the root of the war, that's the, the root of the work in civil society too. Uh, civil society is not only civic, but also civil. And, and, and now we have, uh, we have this situation when it's not so civil, that there are a lot of people who are using these new technologies to, uh, uh, to organize in the name of very uncivil courses. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, um, it'll take some time before the immune systems of, uh, of Western democracy sort of kick in and we will be able to get this uh, uh, somehow under control. And part of that is of course education and, and media literacy, uh, which is beginning to take off in many Western countries. but. Uh, but yes, it is, um, it is a big problem. And, uh, and I think that one, one part of this problem, if I still may add a few sentences on this topic, is that um, uh, these social media have this very strange uh, um, uh, ability to make people feel empowered just because you um, can uh, be hurt. Uh, theoretically, you can be hurt, you, you can write say whatever you want in social media, no one can prevent you from that. But there is this other side, which is uh, maybe even more frustrating than um, the inability of many of these people to, to get to be heard before the rise of social media, uh, because the only way to be heard was to be in the official um, dailies or radio stations or TV stations um, at that time. And that is that uh, something that's uh, fairly brought very nicely um, I think formulated in his uh, in his uh, letter to uh, Ivan Klima, the Czech writer, when Philip Roth said, in uh, in, Czech, in Czechoslovakia, uh, nothing goes but everything matters. Whereas in the United States, everything goes but nothing matters. And uh, and I think that we were not really um, entirely uh, aware of the prof profundity of this of this statement because. Now we are in this situation, even in our uh, post-communist democracies where um, everything goes, but nothing matters. Uh, there are millions of people on social media who can write whatever they want, but then they are very frustrated because their voices are not heard anyway, because you still have to have some social cultural capital to be recognized and heard. But the first impression is, um, Maybe, uh, maybe not. Maybe I should be heard. And I, I get, I get. I'm saying this just last sentence on this. I get a lot of messages from people who write to me and say, you know, I said on on Twitter or Facebook this and this on this and this day, as you know. And I, <laughs> I, I have to reply. Sorry, but I don't know you. I don't know you. But there's this there's this assumption that if you are in social media. You are just a partner in this uh, in this discussion, which you are not. And you know, you wonder if that norm normality in which um, everything goes and nothing matters is is the normality that that Havel and and other dissidents had in mind when they when they said they just wanted um, their countries to be normal countries um, when they were working so hard in the seventies and eighties. We have time for one more question, and, and I would like to bring it back to Havel. Um, and we have two very good, uh, actually, that, that I can um, combine. Um, 
one is from Paul Wilson, who asks, among the liberals in the West, Havel's reputation is still high. In the Czech Republic, it's more, shall we say, nuanced. In many ways, he's become a divisive figure. What if Havel's legacy, do you think, has survived as an active factor in Czech politics today? And then um, very closely related that, uh, Helena has asked, what would Havel think about current democracies in, in your opinion in Europe? So I will start with the, uh, the last question, with the second question. I think that he would be very disappointed uh, uh, by what's going on now, uh, by the rise of uh, all these nationalist populist movements. He often spoke against it. He thought this, this, was, this was wrong. He was, um, you know, he was an, uh, an advocate of, of, of a very idealistic concept. If you go back to Philip Roth, uh, which would sound uh, like uh, everything goes and everything matters. Uh, that would be his view of, uh, of the world, that you, uh, that you should enjoy freedom where everything goes, uh, but uh, that it has to be uh, balanced by responsibility. Uh, by um, uh, by real concern about uh, uh, about the world uh, and not only in your country but globally, uh, he often said that uh, what uh, uh, what happens in China or in Taiwan affects us uh, um, uh, same way that something that happened in uh, in Prague or in Olmots in the Czech Republic. Um, uh, so so that was his view, and uh, and of course he would be very uh very very disappointed um i think that and the first part of your question was about the first question was now i forgot uh, it was about havel's legacy in the Czech oh, Republic legacy, today. Yes, yes, sorry mm -hmm. um so yes so his legacy of course is um um uh, is ambivalent i'll put it this way because uh, um First, he put um, during his presidency, but already before his presidency, he put. Uh, um, uh, he was uh, he set the bar very high for Czech society, and people liked it initially, uh, especially after eighty nine, because they they thought this this is what we should aspire to, this is what we can become, and they also saw how uh, tremendously popular Havel was abroad and how highly estimated or valued he was by. Western leaders. So, uh, although I suspect that many people didn't really understand uh, a lot of things that Havel was saying about uh, civil society, global responsibility, and so on, it was uh, it was this uh, uh, sort of semi-philosophical um, uh, rhetoric that they didn't really understand. They still appreciated it because, and they it was sort of validated by by his reputation uh, abroad. Um, he was invited everywhere. He was quoted everywhere, um, and uh, and so um, it was um, it was the first first ten years, let's say, after the fall of communism. But then, of course, as, as problems began to mount with the transformation process, and a lot of people were among the um, not among the, the, the victors of uh, of uh, of that process, but they felt defeated and left behind. They started associating Havel in many ways with this with this process because he presided over. He didn't really had the executive power um, uh, to 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 do things uh, like Klaus did, and 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 and. and but he was he was held responsible by many people by many people for uh, for the bad things that happened during transformation process. Uh, but I think that um, so. One last thing about this, I think that there is a big uh, gap between um, Havel's reputation abroad and Havel's reputation at home. While abroad, abroad he was viewed as a really global leader, uh, someone who uh, came with new ideas and, uh, and, uh, and so on, and who brought uh, the Czech Republic and, uh, and helped this region in general to to become part of, um, of of NATO and the European Union, uh, at home he was uh, increasingly seen as, uh, as someone who um, uh, first is, is is sometimes saying things that uh, that 
ordinary people uh, see as um, as incomprehensible or maybe even looking down at them and uh, and then uh, of course he was associated with this uh, with these concrete political failures so um, so there, there are still these two sides of Havel, but I think that his legacy is, is changing because he died uh, 10 years ago and, uh, and now uh, people are beginning to, especially in the current situation when we have really uh, a, a very um, um, almost pathological state of affairs here politically, um, uh, people are very often, even people who maybe didn't like Havel so much five, six years ago are beginning to return to him and say, look, this was the best president we had. This, and, and he was completely right when he warned us against this, against mafioso capitalism and things like that. So uh, so that's changing. I, I, I sense a certain change there in public attitudes towards Havel. And, uh, and of course, um, he will, uh, it will, it will continue to change because uh, not only because he is now compared with presidents who, the presidents who came after him, there was recently a public opinion poll showing that people think overwhelmingly that Havel was by far the best president we had after 89. Klaus was far behind and then Zeman, the current president is viewed as, as the worst one. Uh, and so there's this, there's this reference um, um, or this framework in which, uh, in which he can be judged. But also, I think that a lot of ideas that people didn't understand when he was um, expressing them uh, have become more clear uh, because people have also learned about, uh, are learning about how the democratic uh, society works, about how the market economy works and so on. And they now are beginning, some of them, at least I sense it in, in my discussions with, uh, with people, that they are now actually uh, sensing uh, that Havel was right about many things and they say, wait a minute, uh, I didn't understand when he was saying it in 1995 in, his, in this and this speech or when he repeated it uh, there and there, but now now I do understand what uh, what what he meant. So um, so I think there's a change. There's a change which uh, which is in my opinion um, positive and and ongoing. That's, that's very encouraging to hear. And I certainly hope that's the case among young people who probably may not even remember what Havel said. They may not have you know, been alive or were still children. Um, and uh, for them to be rediscovering Havel would be terrific. Um, in that vein, I have a, a, an observation here to offer here from Ambassador Moores, who of course knew Havel very well. He says, Havel's hope for a civic forum seemed utopian in 1989. Um, but it seems that today, as humanity faces the dual existential challenges of global warming and pandemics, Hobble's call for a new sense of human responsibility, humility, and cooperation across cultures and borders is visionary. In Bill Gates' recent book on climate change, he calls for an unusual new human relationship to meet those challenges. Without such a relationship, humanity will fail. And he, um, Gates, he, uh, Gates un unconsciously echoes Havel's big vision. Havel seems relevant today more as a philosopher of future human behavior than as a guide to current political behavior. And um, that's a very interesting observation. Would you agree? Absolutely. That's what I, um, that's what I always felt um, uh, when I uh, worked with, uh, with Havel, that uh, uh, he was um, saying things that uh, uh, were um, uh, in some ways, timeless. You know, they, they were. Uh, he was a visionary, and uh, and he was saying things that uh, many people uh, uh, at that time didn't really understand or didn't appreciate. Uh, but he wasn't saying them just because he wanted to say something shocking or something that looked very clever. He was really saying things because um, he he had this uh, visionary outlook, and and he, he was thinking very deeply about about the world. And so um, uh, I often had to defend him against people who, who would say, you know, this is, this is just impossible. He's telling these fairy tales for, for um, semi-intellectuals who, uh, who love to uh, listen to him because he's saying things that, that uh, uh, do not make any sense for ordinary people. 
but uh, in fact, if you look at, uh, at uh, the, the current state of affairs, uh, he was actually, um, uh, he, was, he was a visionary. And, and even before 89, if you, if you read his uh, essay, not so much uh, the power of powerless, which is very often quoted at Western universities and there are entire courses about this one essay, but his politics and, uh, and conscience. Um, uh, that's that's an essay in which he uh, actually, uh, and I recommend everyone who is listening to this conversation to read it. it it's it's a visionary essay which uh, basically presumes many many things that we are facing today. Um, you know the, uh, the, the 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 clash between uh, politics and bureaucratic. Uh, Apparats, so to speak, as he called them, and uh, and again, this global uh, the need for global responsibility and and so on. Um, so um, yes, uh, you don't get you don't get politicians like that very often, simply because only very few politicians are actually catapulted into uh, politics by history, like him, not by um, uh, by regular processes. Mm -hmm. Ambition, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we have to draw the, this conversation to a close. It's, it's been very interesting. And um, I would just like to add to what you just said that um, the Václav Havel Library Foundation's Disturbing the Peace Award goes to dissidents around the world who are also outstanding writers. And um, I can't tell you how many of them quote or refer to that essay, The Power of the Powerless. Um, you know, as an inspiration for them in their work from Burma to Cuba to, you know, everywhere in the world. So it, it was really a seminal work um, of a, an outstanding public intellectual. And uh, I just have one last question I'd like to ask very quickly. It can even just be a, you can leave it at yes or no if you don't want to elaborate. But um, as a public intellectual, you know, Havel, of course, wrote plays in addition to um, these philosophical essays and and commentaries on on sort of existential questions and uh, you of course in a similar tradition not only write political commentary but also novels are you working on a novel now uh, actually I just finished a novel so it's my fifth novel congratulations yes, so it's it's we, going it's with the publisher so um, we see so it in English uh, this one is in Czech. Uh, this one is, you know, the, I write them in Czech. So this has not been, this one has not been translated. Maybe it will be. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, as, as Paul Wilson knows, uh, uh, these things uh, have their, um, they live in their own time. That uh, writing a political essay is, uh, uh, with regard to time, a very different uh, exercise than writing a novel, which, uh, lives its own life. And so, um, so uh, while your political essays usually are very uh, topical and tied to concrete events and so on, of course, they can be also like others in some ways uh, um, timeless, but, uh, but not, so, not so often, especially if you do political commenting, um, then literature or writing novels is, is, is totally different. And as I said, uh, they, they live their own lives. So, um, uh, so all of a sudden um, uh, you uh, get a letter from uh, someone in Romania who, uh, uh, who writes to you about your third novel and, and, and says that he wants to translate it because uh, uh, he just read it and he's a translator and you completely, uh, you already completely forgot about this novel, you know, we, I would have to probably read it uh, again just to, just to uh, remember what exactly I uh, wrote. So, so the point is that, um, yes, it is, it is a different exercise and Havel was very well aware of that. He, um, he had these two sides and I could always see in him this tension, you know, between the need to to be a politician and to engage in political discourse and sometimes comment on political things which uh, were um, usually very topical. And then this, uh, this larger something in him, um, which was always in him. I just, maybe I would be appropriate if I finished this with, uh, with a very short story. Um, 
uh, which sort of uh, shows how how those mine worked. Uh, we were um, uh, in Israel at the state visit in 1997, and we had dinner with uh, uh, with uh, uh, President Weizmann. And uh, we were in a restaurant, and this was basically a restaurant owned by uh, a, a French uh, uh, lover of, of of good wine. He he moved to Israel from from France. And as we were drinking wine, he kept bringing various bottles, showing them to us. And this this bottle is extremely expensive, and this is this is. The... And then he finally came with uh, a bottle which uh, uh, he held very. Carefully, and he said, "This bottle is from uh, is from 1789. The wine there would be too acidic or undrinkable, but this has tremendous historical value. And to get this bottle, I mortgaged my house and um, uh, and used the money to uh, to buy this bottle. And at that point, my wife divorced me. And um, and I could hear I could hear uh, President Weizmann saying something political." But I could see that Havel just sort of froze, and he could not listen to uh, the president. He was just totally, uh, and I, I saw I saw that something is going something is going on in his mind. And then, finally, when he had a chance, he leaned to me uh, across the table. He said, "What a story! You know, I, I already wrote a play in my mind. This this man is going to." <laughs> drop this bottle one day and he will lose everything. The bottle, his wife, his house, everything. And this will be, but at the same time, he will gain everything. So there was, there was the, uh, that was how he worked, you know, and, uh, and um, uh, so that, that's why it was so uh, tremendously rewarding to, to work with him because uh, he always, uh, his mind always worked on many, many different levels and uh, there was always this tension in, in him uh, which uh, which was very very productive in a, uh, in a way. Well, what a shame that he didn't write that play because it would have been a terrific one. Um, maybe but he did. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's somewhere maybe in the he did, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's <laughs> sitting in a drawer somewhere. But we look forward to to um, seeing your novel. Fingers crossed that it gets translated into English. Um, thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing your, your insights. Um, and we hope to see you again in a hobble yeah. conversation, next time live at the Bohemian National Hall in New York. Thank you and uh, thank you for inviting me and for your excellent moderation. It was very nice to, to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to also add my deepest thanks to, to Yiri for his uh, wonderful ideas for all the memories and uh, fascinating comparisons of Central European countries that is so important to uh, take a step away and look at all these developments. I also hope you, we will be able to have Yiri back uh, maybe after the election that will take place in the Czech Republic this fall. So I, I'm sure that we will have a lot of things uh, to talk about again. So again, thank you, Meryl, and thank you, Yiri, very much. I would like to take this opportunity and to invite our attendees to join us for our next Havel conversation that will be on March 7. So only already in two weeks and it will be with Czech American artist Peter Seas, who will be in conversation with a, a lawyer and our board member Bill Shipsey. So please join us again. Also, don't forget, we are a nonprofit. We are grateful for any contribution that you can make. You can still do it through Eventbrite or through our website. Again, thank you very much to all attendees. Thank you to Yiri and Marilyn giving us your time on this Sunday afternoon or evening. And uh, we hope to see you soon, both on Zoom and live. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Paula. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.